Amen. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Let's say it one more time. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're glad you're here. I'm so grateful that uh, Junior's here. He's a senior associate for Gilead, and we're so grateful to have him with us as well. It's always a pleasure to have you when you're part of our service, and we're so glad you're here today. I'm excited because we have an, an incredible message this morning. We're continuing our series, as you know, uh, on what's important to God, and today we're going to be talking about trusting God. Putting our faith and trust in God is important to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we're so glad you're here. I, I really touched my heart as Will was talking. You may have come in this morning. You may be fighting a battle. You may be going through a storm. You may be experiencing things that look impossible. Let me encourage you today. With men, it may be impossible, but the Bible says with God, all things are possible. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, that we serve a can-do God. All things are possible with him. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 32. And we're going to be looking at this chapter. It's a powerful chapter. Um, but I want you to look at this verse, and we're going we're gonna to jump right into the message. But it's simply this. Many of you may be familiar with this verse. Uh, verse 27 says this. Now, this is God speaking. God says this, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? What a powerful verse. I'm the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? Let's pray. Father, I just pray that, Lord, you'd add your blessing to your word today. And, Father, as we look at this very important subject, Lord, I, I covet your anointing. I pray that you would guide my lips. Help me to say what you would have me to say. Lord, help me to challenge us. Lord, help me to be a tool in your hand to touch and encourage your people, we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. I was talking with my brother, Tom, not too long ago, and I just smile at this uh, illustration. We talk about his oldest son, Cole, who is now in college, but when he was younger, now, some of you may have heard this story, but this little story really inspired the message today. Um, he was trying to learn how to ride a bicycle. Can you remember those days when you tried to learn to ride a bicycle, maybe start with a tricycle and get those training wheels? Well, he was, and he was, it just wasn't working. And he kept saying, Daddy, Daddy, I can't do it. And he said, oh, yes, you can. And he kept encouraging him. Finally, uh, my brother Tom got a little frustrated. And he said, Cole, what's your middle name? Oh, uh, it's, uh, it's Can Do It. <laughs> Cole, Can Do It, Carter. <laughs> I can't do it. Well, Daddy, I can't write it. What's your middle name? It's Cole, Can Do It. Carter. And so after a while, he finally got the swing of it and started riding his bike. And so every time Cole would reach a place in his life uh, where he was tempted to say, I can't do it, Tom would look at him and say, Cole, what's your middle name? <laughs> can do it? That's right. Cole can do it. They went into a uh, convenience store real quick to, to get some gas, and Tom was in a hurry, and Cole was admiring all the candy bars and all the goodies. He said, Daddy, can I get a candy bar? He said, no, can't do it right now. Daddy, what's your middle name? <laughs> can do it. 
So tonight, to, this morning, we're going to be talking about God who can do anything. God's a can-do-it God. And if you came this morning and you're struggling with a situation or a circumstance, I want you to know that God is greater than your circumstances. God is greater than the problems you may be confronting. Sometimes that problem gets so large in our minds that it eclipses God. It really does. And I want to challenge you today because you know what God does with some of the problems that seem so big that it eclipses him? He steps on our problems. He's bigger than our problems. He's larger than our circumstances. He is greater. You know, there's a, uh, uh, a polling company that uh, has been polling for a number of years, and they poll different uh, things. And, but one particular question they ask uh, the American people, and they've been doing this since 1944. And here's the question that, that they ask. Do you believe in God? And uh, recently in this polling, um, it reached the lowest that it has ever reached since 1944. It was 81% say they believe in God. Well, another company has kind of caught the bandwagon, and they started doing a similar type of polling. Now, they've been polling for the last 10 years. But what they they changed it up a little a little bit because do you believe in God is pretty a pretty broad question, isn't it? Yeah. And so they ask, uh, if you believe in God, what do you mean? And as they've been polling over the last ten years, well, recently it came up to eighty percent say that they believe in God, but when they began to break it down, and this, what, this is kind of the bad news, 56% say that they believe in the God of the Bible. Another 33% or so say, well, I believe in a higher power. I believe in, you know, the forces with you out there somewhere. It's just kind of this ethereal higher power, not sure if we call it a God or what, but there's something out there. And that should be alarming to people in the church or followers of Christ. In other words, what it's saying is that really only Jews and Christians believe in the God of the Bible. And I, I got, you know, I've spent my life studying not only the God of the Bible, but uh, in school, I've looked at a lot of the other religions. I've got to be honest with you. Uh, there's no other gods out there that really are appealing. There's no other God except the God of the Bible that is, should garnish our uh, belief and worship. Uh, but the, the numbers seem to be going down lower and lower that people are getting away from the God of the Bible. But I'm going to tell you why I believe in the God of the Bible, because he is a can-do-it God. So today we're going to be talking about the can-do God. He's not a, just some generic God. He's not just some God that is, well, whatever you want him to be type of God. But I want to give you, before we jump into... Uh, the nitty-gritty of this message, I want to kind of give you a definition of how I see the God of the Bible. You know, the bottom line uh, word in all theology is sovereignty. What, is that? what does that mean? Sovereignty. It means this, that the God of the Bible and the God that I believe in can do anything, anywhere, anytime that would be consistent, listen to me, with his divine nature, which is talking about his character, and that would be in accordance with his sovereign will. In other words, we serve a sovereign God that can do anything, anytime, anywhere that would be consistent with his divine nature that would ultimately make him happy. Well, you mean God's not there to make me happy? Revelation 4.11, we studied this. 
It says, for thy pleasure, O God, all things were created. God is a sovereign God. So are there, so God can do anything. In fact, you know, there's a question that when I was in, when I was early as a teenager in church, and then even when I went to Bible school, you have all these questions that, that I call, they're like trick questions. And you probably have some of them too. Like, does, does Adam have a belly button? <laughs> Who cares? Well, it makes it, uh, can God create a rock so big that he can't pick it up? How many have ever heard that? Okay, three of us. Well, it's out there. And I, especially when I was a teenager, it would just seem like people in, in, in my school were constantly trying to prod and poke and, and poke holes in who God is. Listen, God is a sovereign God, and God can do anything. And let me answer that question. Can God create a rock so big that he can't lift it up? The answer is no. Because of the definition. Uh, If God created anything that he couldn't do, it would be inconsistent with his character, his divine nature. Plus, in addition, it wouldn't be in accordance with his sovereign will, would it? And, And there's some good things about God's consistency and faithfulness in his character and divine nature. Because God will never lie to you. God will never do anything to harm you. In fact, isn't that what the word says? Uh, My plans for you is to what? Prosper you, not harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. So God is all about you. And as Will pointed out earlier, God is crazy about you. You're the apple of his eye. You are what captures God's attention 24-7. Every minute of every day of every hour, God's thoughts are on you. In fact, Psalm 139 says his thoughts concerning you outnumber the sand. You've heard me say that. I I don't know if we really grasp that, but that is who God is. God can do anything. Now, as I get older and the longer I'm in ministry, listen to me, church. I'm convinced that God would almost rather you not believe in him at all than to believe in the kind of God that some of us believe in. Hello? I mean, amen? (laughs) Because I'm going to tell you one of the biggest insults to God is that we view God as too small too little. Some of us worship a thimble-sized God. What an insult. Listen, it doesn't bother God if you don't believe in him. In fact, the Bible says if you don't believe in God, the word of God says that the person that doesn't believe in him is a fool. God just goes on. Uh, God, what really breaks his heart, what really hurts God What really insults a sovereign, all-powerful, almighty God is that we see him and view him and act around him as if he's a little thing. Listen, God is great and mighty. So what I want to do is I want us to look at this, this chapter in Jeremiah. And I think as we look at several of the verses in this chapter, I think you're going to see how God... It just comes alive how big he really and truly is. Now, let me give you a background. As you're, I want you to turn in your Bibles or iPhone or iPad to this chapter because it's important that you see what the Word of God says about God. Now, Jerusalem is under siege at this particular point. The Babylonians have come in. Um, they are going to uh, take Israel captive Listen, God has warned Israel over and over again that if you obey him, he will bless you. But if you disobey, he will curse you. And uh, Israel didn't listen. 
They didn't obey. They broke his law. And so the Babylonians are, are just on the horizon about to come in to take over uh, Jerusalem. Now, God has told Jeremiah that this is going to take place. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The temple is going to be toppled. And the nation of Israel would be brought down and taken into slavery. Now, a strange thing that God does is he asked Jeremiah to go out and buy a field. Uh, doesn't that sound rather strange? Jeremiah, go and purchase a piece of property. Take your savings. Buy this. Get a title deed to this property. Um, okay. Jeremiah does it, but Jeremiah has some questions, questions like you and I have. Well, if the Babylonians are coming in, are going to take over the uh, all this land and take the people off as captives to, to Babylon with this monarch named King Nebuchadnezzar, it seems like this would be a colossal waste of money. It seems like, God, why would you want me to buy a piece of property? And so God answers Jeremiah with a question. Verse 27, our text. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Now, I, I think what is interesting about this question is, is simply this. This isn't ask of God. It's not ask about God. It's not ask to God. This is a question that is asked by God. Jeremiah, simple question. Yes or no? Is anything too hard for me? Look, you don't have to deliberate about it. Just yes or no. Is there anything too hard for the living God? God's answering the question. Now, this is really a, a rhetorical question <coughs> because Jeremiah has already answered the question in verse 17. If you look at verse 17, look at this passage. Powerful passage. It says, Ah, so sovereign there's our word, sovereign, the bottom line word in all theology. So ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens. We always talking about that earlier, wasn't he? You've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Now, when Jeremiah said this, he really didn't realize the magnitude or the breadth of the truth of what he was saying. There's no way that he could possibly uh, know the scope of what he was declaring. If he really understood what he is saying in this statement, uh, he would have believed it even more uh, than he did at the time because there's something that we know today that he didn't know, and something that we're going to learn today from, from this. You know, the next time you go outside and, uh, at, in the evening or at night and you look and you see the beautiful sky, you're going to look up, and what you're going to see is the Milky Way. We live in what is known as the Milky Way galaxy. If the Milky Way galaxy was the size we could reduce it to the size of North America. That's the United States and Canada. Our solar system, which the Earth is a part of, would fit into the size of a coffee cup. That's how big the Milky Way galaxy is. And there are two spacecrafts, I know many of you are already familiar with this, that we launched 45 plus years ago called the Voyager 1 and the Voyager 2, yes. And these crafts, ever since 45 years ago, have been traveling at a speed of 100,000 miles per hour. I mean, you have to go that fast just to keep from being run over on I-95. 
Think about it. I've never seen so many crazy drivers on all 95. It's getting worse, isn't it? But these spacecraft are traveling at 100,000 miles per hour. Now, since that time, over 45 years ago, they have traveled, listen to this, 14.5 billion miles. When engineers send a message traveling at the speed of light to that spacecraft, it takes 20 hours for it to receive that message. And yet, the solar system in which we live is so tiny in the grand scheme of things that uh, it fits alongside and, and will even, he was preaching my message this morning. Uh, there are billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And, and what is so fascinating is that the Milky Way galaxy is one of a hundred million other galaxies in the universe, in the expanse of space as we know it. I think that's fascinating. Uh, let me share it another way with you. If you were to send a message uh, traveling at the speed of light to the end of the universe as we know it, it would take 15 billion years to get to the other end of the universe. 15 billion universe. And so Jeremiah says, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you have made the what? The heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. I want to tell you that there is nothing too hard for God. If God is able to do that and create stars that we can't even see yet, that are billions of light years away, he can, I think that qualifies him. I think that's a pretty good resume for him to meet your need. And if you've come in this place this morning and you don't know how God's going to work out this situation, you don't know how God's going to help you pay that bill, you don't know how God's going to turn that family situation around, look to a God that can do anything. Amen. Nothing is too great for our God. Amen. With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Amen. I'm going to preach it. Because we need to hear this. God's tired of us treating him like he's a little thimble. He's a little token of appreciation. No, he's the creator of this universe, church. He can do anything. He's a can-do God. Amen. I might get excited here in just a minute. So, the pastor, that sounds like we're going to have a real deep theological discussion this morning. No? No, I, I just want to give you four applications in this passage. Four applications that you can take away on Sunday and take it to work on Monday. Because when you're going through the storm of life, when you're going through the challenges or confronted by things in your life that, that you just don't see any way, I want to challenge you. God can do anything. The first thing, and I want you to take notes because these are important uh, statements or applications, and I think, I think if you've never taken notes, you may want to write these down. I know some of you have great memories, but the more gray hairs I get on my head the less I remember. <clears throat> so after church, I always have dozens of people, hey, Pastor, can we do this? Can you do that? Can you call someone? I, and I say, yes, I mean well. I've got to write it down. Or if you can write it down for me. That's why it's important we write these down so we don't forget. You need to remember these. Number one of the four applications. Here's application number one. There is no promise, say no promise, no promise. so big that God can't keep it. Hallelujah. Wow. It's true. Jeremiah is referencing a promise God made centuries before in verse 21 and 22 of chapter 30, 32. I want us to look at this verse. He... Centuries ago, God made this promise. 
And Jeremiah is bringing it up to God. <clears throat> Notice what he says. You brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders. By a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with great terror, you gave them this land you had, and this is an important word we're going to talk about, sworn to give their ancestors a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, this word sworn is an important word in the Hebrew. It's a judicial term, which means to take a sacred oath. A lot of times when we go into court and you put your, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I had to go to court for my neighbor and uh, they had me take an oath and they said, do you uh, promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? And they stopped there. And I said, so help me God. <laughs> uh, well, we don't have to say that anymore. I do. That's right. I need God's help. I think if we get back to putting God in our society, things will turn around. That's right. We work hard to take God out of everything. In fact, that's why since 1944, those who believe in the God of the Bible, the sovereign God, has dropped to the lowest point ever, to 56%. That's alarming. So do you know how many promises... God has made in his word, and you've heard me say this before. Over How many? Over 8,000. Well, that's, that's really true, but the promises from God to mankind, that's close. It is over 8,000, but actually, um, to be specific, promises to mankind. <clears throat> well, you know, I've learned a long time ago um, have y'all ever heard that phrase, never uh, over-promise and under-deliver? Am I the only one? <laughs> well, I just learned as I get older not to make so many promises like I used to when I was younger because we fail to keep our promises. There was a man by the name of Everett Storms, and you can look this up. He was a school teacher in Ontario, Canada. He had read the Bible through 26 times, and he was going to read it through the 27th time. And he decided, as he read through the Bible the 27th time, that he would write down every promise in the Word of God. And at the end, he would add up how many there were. And so uh, it took him a year and a half. And here's what he found. In the Bible, uh, there are 7,487 promises that God made specifically to the human race. And I want to tell you, I can confidently say that God is kept, God is keeping, and God will keep a hundred percent of his promises. God keeps his promises. Let me ask you a question. How many have ever made a promise that you didn't keep? Okay. Man, there's like six of us. Right. Yeah, oh, two hands up. I don't, are we awake? Are we, Helen, I know we've got some great coffee. We got <clears throat> a lot of people come and get their best sleep right here. Amen. Well, there's a little boy playing with another little boy, and, uh, and the little boy was alarmed by what his friend Johnny had told him, so he goes into his dad's house, and he says, Dad, you know, Johnny just told me that his dad has a list of everyone in the neighborhood that he can whip. And dad, you're number one on the list. <laughs> what? What'd you say, son? Johnny's dad has a list of everybody he can whip in this neighborhood, and you're number one on the list. Oh, a little bit of a 
kind of pushed his button a little bit, and he says, well, where does Johnny's dad live? Oh, he just lives three houses down. I'll show you. They go outside right there, that, you know, that beige house right there. So he said, all right, we're going to go see. So he walks three houses down. He goes up, and he knocks on the door. A man answers the door, and he says, are you Johnny's dad? Yes, I am. Well, I understand that you have a list of everybody in the neighborhood that you can whip. Is that true? Yes, it is. And I've heard that I'm number one on the list. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Well, I don't think you can whip me. So what are you going to do about it? Uh, I'm going to take your name off the list. (laughs) Making a promise we can't keep, right? We never have to worry about God not keeping his promise. God keeps his promise. Uh, You know, God spoke through a prophet named Balaam. Many of you know in Numbers 23, verse 19, I want you to hear what God said. And actually, Balaam was trying to bring a curse on Israel, but he couldn't. And this is what he spoke to Balaam. And I, I, I love this passage. This is God speaking here. God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I want you to know we may not want to make a lot of promises because it's tough for us to fulfill, but God's not in the same category we are. Those 7,000 plus promises will be fulfilled because God said it. Remember the creator of the universe? The heavens declare the glory of God. There's nothing that God can't do, and his promises will come to pass. We need to ask ourselves, what God do we believe in? When you say you believe in God, what do you mean? Do you believe that you you worship a thimble-sized God? Or do you believe in a God that can do anything that would be consistent with his divine nature in accordance with his will? Amen. God does not change his mind. God is a promise keeping God. Listen, you may be facing a storm so big that you can't see your way out. God will see you through. All things work together for good to them who love God. Who love God. You've heard me say this. If you don't love God, that promise isn't for you. It doesn't say all things work together for those who don't love God. How many love God this morning? Well, look, this promise is absolutely true for you. Write it down. It's your promise. God can do anything. The second point, you may want to write this down, is this. There is no prayer so great that God can't answer it. And we're getting all the these four points from this single passage. Look at verse 21 again. Verse 21 says, You brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. I think most of us here this morning uh, have a a Bible background to some degree. And uh, and it's no surprise, this is referencing the Red Sea. And and if you don't have a Bible background, how many have seen the Ten Commandments? Okay, that covers the rest of us. Right there? Have you ever wondered why God did the miracle of taking the people out of Egypt, uh, taking them through the Red Sea on dry land, and destroying the pursuing army that was following? Verse chapter 
20, chapter 2, verse 23 and 25 of Exodus tells us. And I want you to see why God did this. First of all, they, the nation of Israel were slaves to the Egyptian nation, the most powerful nation in the world. There was no we- they had no weapons, no money, they had no leader, and, and probably most challenging is they had no hope. But they had an ace in the hole, so to speak. One thing that they did was they prayed. Look at verse 23 through 25. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. They cried out and and their cause went up to God's what it's saying. Verse 24, and God heard their groaning. First of all, I want you to hear that. God heard their groaning. God hears you when you pray. Uh, some of you are listening to the enemy try to tell you, well, God, oh, God might hear pastor's prayer. God might hear Byron's prayer or Will's prayer, but God didn't hear my prayer. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says, and this is our confidence, that when we pray, God does what? Hears us. And here's an example. He heard the prayers of the people. Uh, They're groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. God cares. Sometimes you may be in a place where you think he doesn't care, but God does hear our prayer, and he cares about you. In fact, he instructs us to cast our cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. So why did God raise up Moses and part the Red Sea and wipe out the Egyptian army? It's because of the prayers of his people. I came across a quote lately about prayer that I I thought it would be good for you to, to, to see as well. Notice what it says. Nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer except that which lies outside the will of God. Nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer except that which lies outside the will of God. Wow. See, God can do anything, and prayer is a vehicle that God chooses to use. You see, prayer can do anything God can do, and God can do anything. Pastor Ashcroft, John Ashcroft, who was our attorney general at one point, um, I heard him preach once, and he said this, God does nothing except in response to prayer. In fact, you look it up. Just about every miracle that it's transpired in the Bible was as a result of prayer. And we get this incredible verse that I just quoted. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to what? His will. Sometimes we just kind of skip over that. God has a sovereign will. And he can do anything, anytime, anywhere that that would be consistent with his divine nature that would be in accordance with his sovereign will. Notice again that phrase, he hears us. I think that's powerful. Doesn't matter how many times you've heard that verse. It's an important verse. Because prayer can do anything God can do. There's only one prayer that God can't answer. One prayer that God can't do. One prayer. It's the prayer that's never been prayed. What did James say? James says, you have not because you, see, you you guys could preach this. You don't need me up here preaching. You you know the Bible. But do we believe it? Is it just nice sayings and we grew up that way? 
Or are we men and women of the word of God that, that exhibit faith in a God that created the stars? And, and, and has, the Bible says in Psalms that he's named every one of those stars. I, I can't even fathom that. We serve a God that has always been. He has no beginning. He has always existed. We, we can't even conceive that. And, and in some sense, I, I like having a birthday party. God doesn't have. He's just always been. Think about that. And you think God can't handle your situation or that person or that circumstance or that financial issue or whatever it may be. God can do what? He's a can-do God, isn't he? He's sovereign. Now, I'm grateful for it, says, according to his will, because I'm, there are a lot of prayers I pray that I'm glad that God didn't answer. A couple of cute little girls in high school. I thought they were the one. <sighs> so grateful. God did not answer those prayers. Why? Because it wasn't his sovereign. He knows what's ahead. We think we do. We, we got a handle on all this. We think we know what the next step is. Listen, God will surprise you. God helped me to have a church that has great influence. Well, we're less than 100 here this morning, right? But you know what God has done? God's answered that prayer. Not only are we on the internet, but God has opened a, a resource. We are reaching thousands of people through WMER radio. People right now listening to this, this broadcast as a result of the door that's open for this church. I told my good friend Matt Pilot that we're reaching tens of thousands of people. How are you doing that, Nate? Because he's at Christ Fellowship. He's got 17 campuses. And he's, I said, we're on the radio. God did that. Sometimes God answers prayer in a way that we don't, we may not have answered it that way. Hallelujah. God answers prayer prayer. Let's, let's move on. I want to get to these other two before time runs out. Number three, there's no problem so hard that God can't solve it. See, not only is God omnipotent, but he's also omniscient, which means he knows all things. In fact, if there was one dotting of the I or crossing of the T that God did not know he would not be God. Hear that. God knows everything, past, present, future. He knows. And notice what Jeremiah says in verse 19. Kind of supports it. Great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. Your eyes. What, what is this really saying? This is saying this, that God, you never miss a thing. And because you hear, see, and know everything, you can do everything. You know, you're, you're never going to hear God say, well, you know, I'd really like to help you with that, but... I don't know how. Yeah. yeah, I sure I'd love to get involved, but I'm stumped. That's over my head. That's beyond my pay grade. Hello? I mean amen. I'm trying, honey, to not say hello. Trying to be a good husband. <clears throat> but God is greater than our problems. We all have problems. We all have problems. We all have problems. Hey, 
Amen. If you're here this morning, you don't think you have a problem. That's your biggest problem. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, everyone has problems. I can tell you something that every one of us fight. We, in some way, fashion, it may be different for different people, but every one of us fight temptation. The devil's constantly nagging at you to do something wrong, this tempt, temptation, whatever it is. Jeremiah and Chapter 13, 23, look earlier in the book. Notice what he says. Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Every one of us have been affected by the disease, that DNA of sin. You know, the greatest threat to the human race it's not climate change, environment, gun control, war, or a list of many other things. Those, those aren't the greatest threat. The greatest threat to, to mankind is sin. Yes. And, and here's the challenge. Here's the problem. Let me, uh, and let me tell you why. How can an imperfect, unrighteous, sinful human being have a relationship? with a perfect, righteous, holy God. And that's a challenge many people struggle with. Yeah, Pastor, I, I'm never going to be good enough. I, you know, I, I'm bad. I, I need to get my act. I've heard this a lot. I, I need to get my act together before I come to God. That's like saying, I got to go take a bath before I get cleaned up. Listen, God can handle that. So what will bridge the gap between a perfect God and an imperfect person who's been ravaged by sin? Well, God came up with a solution. God sent his son. Jesus Christ is a perfect human being to take our place for the penalty of sin. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The Bible also says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only way to resolve sin is there is a price that must be paid. God is a just God. But God sent his son who was perfect to live a vicarious life, to become a substitute for us. And he took our sins. He endured the cross so that we could be made right and justified in the eyes of God. Well, that word justified is one of those big theological terms, isn't it? What does justified mean? I like to remember it this way. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. And so we are made right in the eyes of God because of what Christ did at Calvary, and God solved our greatest problem, the sin problem, if we'll simply receive Christ into our hearts. Amen? Amen. Yes. Number four, and finally, as Byron comes to the piano, there's no person so sinful that God cannot save him. And I know every one of you are thinking, ah, Oh, well, you, you don't know my Uncle Bill. Yeah. You don't know my ex-spouse. You don't work for my employer. I want you to know there's no person so sinful that God cannot save him. And we have a classic example right here in Jeremiah. Look at verse 28 of our text. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to give this city into the hands of the Babylonians and to, I want you to notice, who? <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar. He was one of the worst monarchs in antiquity. 
he committed grave atrocities. We don't have time this morning to go into all of them. He even became arrogant. Many of you that are Bible students remember he uh, even began to worship himself as God. He ascended himself above the throne of God and as a result became insane for a little while. Remember? But I want you to hear the very last recorded words of King Nebuchadnezzar, the last words that ever came across his lips that were recorded. Look at Daniel chapter 4, 37. When God restored him, put him back in his right mind, he got in his right mind because he recognized the king of heaven. Notice what it says in verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Wow. Such a wicked king. That's Miles apart. You know that person you think is, is impossible. God could never reach that person. It could be a son, daughter, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, cousin. It could be a neighbor next door that's driving you crazy. It could be, and many of you right now in your mind, you're picturing that person right now that you think is impossible. If God can turn around a wicked king who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and, and, and took away captives into slavery, God's people, and God can turn him around? Don't you think it might be possible that God can soften the heart of someone that you think is impossible? Remember, Will quoted at the beginning of this during worship. With men it's impossible, but not with God. For with God, for with God, for with God, say it like you mean it. There you go. All things. Say all things. And it's hard for us to really believe this in our world. All things are what? Really? There's a lot of skeptics out there. Well, you know, you're you're reading from the NIV, NASB, ESV. You're not reading it from the Young's literal translation. You don't know what you're talking about. And listen, I I get emails from people. I just got a, a an email not too long ago. It says you're a liar. You think I'm gonna lose any sleep over that? Somebody in Wisconsin. Somebody in Wisconsin doesn't like what I'm preaching. I have an issue with God, not me. I'm just his servant. I'm faithful to preach what's in the pages of his word. It's so easy to, to water down the word of God these days. We don't want to offend anybody. Because, you know, you know it's, it's a good... I, I was listening to someone ask a question of a, a pastor on, on YouTube. And he said, well, you know, God is a good theory. The pastor shot right back. God's not a theory. God is a person. And he's big enough to minister to whatever you're going through. We just have to, we, we, we're listening to the world. That's why John said, look, don't become like the world. Don't, don't love the world. But what happens is we listen and we listen and we have become indoctrinated by the world to the point that, well, God's just a nice theory. Is he? Do you serve a can-do God? 
that can do anything, anytime, anywhere. God, the Bible says, here's what, here's, God says this to us. The eye of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are right toward him. He's looking for someone. And it could be someone in this room that's willing to step out in faith, to trust God, to believe God for the impossible, knowing that God can do anything, anywhere, anytime, that nothing is too hard for him. Can God find someone that believes that? I, I, can he? Donovan's got two hands up. Amen. All of us need our hammer hands up. Here am I. God doesn't need your ability. God just wants your availability to trust him. And some of you come in here, and I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way. And you're hurting, you're going through a storm. It seems impossible. It's not impossible for God. And I pray that this message will light your fire to dare to trust and believe God for the impossible. Not to give up, not to quit. I close with this. This isn't in my notes. So I'm gonna close with this. I'm gonna make this really quick. You've heard this story before, but there was a lady in in Washington who was praying for her son. He didn't want to have anything to do with God. He started pursuing a lifestyle that was totally opposite what God's word teaches is a healthy lifestyle. Started chasing after this world. He wanted to pursue everything. Wound up with AIDS in a hospital in Omaha. And I went to visit him. You've heard me tell the story. It just, you know, it's back when, you know, I had to, I was like a space guy. I had to put all this stuff on. I was like an astronaut going into this room. He said, look, who are you? I said, well, I'm Pastor Nate. He said, well, you can just turn right around and go out the door you came in. I said, I just put all this space gear on. Really? And he said, Pastor, I've done things so horrible that no one, even God, can forgive. I said, no, that's why I'm here. I brought good news. You're exactly the person God loves who's crazy about. And after a year, uh, uh, an hour, he gave his heart there. Methodist Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. Main thoroughfare. Shortly after that, he died. So I, I went to do the funeral and I came in and his mom was just, just, Bless her heart. I just, I knew who his mother was because she was crying uncontrollably. I went up and introduced myself. I was right out of college. She said, who are you? Well, I kind of recognized that. Kind of what your son said to me, who are you? I didn't look like a pastor. I was right out of college. I was young. I said, well, I'm the pastor going to officiate. And she just wailed more. My son died and went into eternity without Christ. And I said, no, I've got good news. I led your son to Jesus Christ on his deathbed. You should have seen the change, the rejoicing. that took 20 years of praying. She didn't quit. She didn't give up. She said, I kept believing and trusting God. Listen, you're here this morning, and and God directed me to speak this message this morning. I don't care what time it is. I want you to hear this because you're hurting. Or there's something in your life that just seems too great 
too big? Have you made God too small? God wants me to remind you that he's bigger than your problems and circumstances. And he's going to do a miracle in your life if you don't give up. God's wanting to birth some miracles today. Birth ministries, birth things in our lives to help us. We are in the last days to make a difference in our world. He wants to use you. Father, I thank you for this message. Lord, you've turned so many people around. You, Lord, you have a way of changing hearts. You changed the heart of a terrorist named Paul and use him to write most of the New Testament. Lord, turn us around. Oh, Lord, incre- help thou our unbelief. Help thou our lack of faith. Lord, keep us from putting you a thimble size. Oh, Lord, may we respect you and put you and fear you as the creator of heaven and earth, as Jeremiah did. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you're here this morning, and you said, Pastor, I don't know if it's for anyone else, but the Holy Spirit used you to speak to my life this morning, and there's an issue, whatever it may be. It could be hundreds of different. Some of you may have multiple issues in your life you need God to deal with. Raise your hand right now. God will see. Raise it right up. Don't be ashamed. You want God to minister in need? Yes, God sees these hands. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hallelujah. And I know. I know you. I know many of you have some some real hurdles, some real challenges. God's bigger. God's bigger. He saw every hand lifted this morning, and he's going to do a miracle in your life. Don't give up. Alice told me this morning, she came in. She said, Pastor, I've been thinking of you lately. She said, you pray for me and heal my knee. Well, I didn't heal her knee. God used me to pray for her. God healed her knee. She said, a couple of times I've had a little bit of pain, and I've just thought, no, God is my healer. And she said the pain just went away just immediately. The enemy will try to downgrade your faith and discourage you with everything he can. Don't let him do it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world or anything you confront. Hallelujah. Second question I want to ask is simply this. We always try to ask. You're here this morning, but maybe you've never invited Christ to come and live in your heart. That's a good place to start. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right now? We're going to pray for you if there's anyone. Maybe if you're watching online or listening by radio, simply say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I make a commitment to live for Christ all my days. And he'll come in and make residence with you. Father, I pray for this church. Lord, you seen the number of hands lifted. Lord, you've seen those who've had two hands up. Lord, they need a miracle. Father, increase their faith. Lord, regardless of what circumstances look like, Father, may we be men and women who dare to trust the can-do God in our lives. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ain't God good? Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I needed that. Amen. Now, that's from the Lord, not me. I, God is, is here to help you. Amen. Hallelujah. I just sense the presence of the Lord in such a sweet way. Amen. Don't you? He's here. He's here. Amen.